Good day learners and welcome to our first module within your grade 11 CAT curriculum. So this is module 1.1 and it's all about ICT. So what are we going to be looking at? We're going to look at the role and value of ICT in the workplace. CAT, well, what can I say? <laughs> That's the most valuable subject, the computer and then protecting your information. So let's get started. Now, the first thing we're looking at is the role and value of ICT in the workplace. And as part of the revision, we need to ask, just maybe remind ourselves about how ICT influences one's life and lifestyle. Think about the jobs that we do, the way we store photos, watch videos, the way we search things, the way we entertain ourselves, the way we shop and do banking, the way we communicate, the way we interact with friends, and the way we obtain and use information. I always try to put myself in a position where think about how things were 30 years ago, 40 years ago. So maybe not your lifetime, but those of your parents or your grandparents. And have a look at the way they did things, the type of jobs, the way they did shopping, the way they did banking, all of those compared to the way we do it today. And then you'll see immediately the massive influence that ICT has on our daily lives. Right. So, looked at that. We today take for granted a technology that we use all over the show. And that is near field communication. So this is, this is just an example showing you, again, how ICT influences our daily life. Um, many of you use your phones to pay for things, right? Um, a lot of us use our cards and we don't, well, we used to tap on the machines. Now we don't even have to tap on the um, payment machines. We just bring our card near to it. And that's what NFC is, near field communication. It provides a wireless connection between two devices within close proximity. So they, I don't have to touch the device with my card or with my phone. I can just bring it near to the device. That's why they call it near field communication. So it allows for two-way communication with both devices being involved um, and they are able to send and receive information. And you can see the different examples where near field communication can be and is used. And there we see um, a typical example of what we refer to these days as contactless payment systems. Okay, this was obviously pushed a lot during COVID where they didn't want us to use physical money. Um, so that technology has really just moved forward in leaps and bounds. Right, then communication. Um, it's a good thing and it's a bad thing because yes, we are sort of over available, <laughs> available um, through too many platforms, you know, Facebook, whether it's instant messaging on WhatsApp, um, whether it's emails or blogs, we are technically always available and never switched off because think about it this way. Let's go back before you were born, um, before emails and cell phones and that. When somebody left work, they would leave work. They would leave school and that was it. You couldn't communicate with them after that because there was no way to get hold of them. Today, you can simply look at your parents, um, friends, others out there in the, in the working world and you can see how even though you leave your workplace, you can still be contacted via email, WhatsApp, all these things. So you are, and this is a big problem with ICT, you are never switched off. This is why there's a movement currently where we encourage, especially you lot as learners, to take time to actually switch off that device. Now, you might not have to power it off. You're just putting it on silent and leaving it one side for an hour, hour and a half, um, so that it doesn't take complete control of your life. Okay. Um, what about the access to information? Well, we've got a massive massive pool um, from which to extract information. Um, we've got the TV, we've got radio. I don't know how many of you still listen to the radio. Uh, we can throw in podcasts, vodcasts, 
um, cell phone, SMSs, the internet being a huge one, email. So we have a lot of access to information. We can find info very quickly. I mean, if somebody says, oh, did, did you hear so-and-so um, was in an accident or this celeb died or whatever, you can very quickly go and um, find that information, determine if it's actually reliable, and then analyze and summarize, right? To see, oh, wait, no, this is a fake thing. Um, this is this is not real. What about our leisure? Movies, music, printed media, video on demand, right? Which means we can watch when we want. Um, internet TV, not using radio signals, online travel bookings, um, online gaming, right? Fitness programs in front of the TV with a gaming console. Um, there are there are just so many ways in which ICT has influenced even our leisure. What about in the workplace? What role does it play in the workplace? Well, the very fact that I'm doing these videos um, in my workplace is testament to the fact that we are using this every single day, even in the classroom. We can now work wherever we have access to a computer, and um, many people have started working from home. They've been able to do exactly the same amount of work, if not more, um, and they're doing it just with a computer and an internet connection. We can communicate more effectively because now we can do everything online. We can store and process vast quantities of data to make more informed decisions. We can identify and adapt to changing trends and perform tasks that are difficult or dangerous for human beings to do. I always think of the uh, bomb robots. So you have these robots that will go in if there's any kind of threat like that, and they will go and search through, and they've got a little camera on them and things. So um, ICT plays a massive role in, in the workplace today, and they just continue um, with a lot as well. And, yeah, they just mentioned that ICT allows us to do all these things more quickly and with less manpower. However, there is a negative role to this, right? It does require a constant upgrading of skills. So us as human beings, our skills to be able to work with this and the hardware and software that the machine, you know, uh, makes use of. You have smaller pools of highly skilled ICT workers replacing large numbers of staff. So unfortunately, we do have that. And ICT employees working longer hours to meet the expectations of customers. Okay, so... That's just a bit of revision. Just, just, just understand the role of ICT. This, well, these, these are exam questions where they do talk about ICT. Um, they will sometimes give you a scenario, and then off of that scenario, they want to know well, how does ICT play a role here? What are the advantages? What are the disadvantages, etc. Okay. Then we talk about CAT as the most valuable subject, and a lot of the other subjects they just don't want to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> but cat is, um, and I, I know I'm biased by, by saying that, but it's okay. I don't mind. <laughs> so cat teaches us to do what? It teaches us to use computers to solve problems. Now, I know many people when they, especially parents, when they hear, oh, my child's doing cat. It's like, oh, it's this easy subject. Some of your friends might have also thought, oh, let's just do cat as this lovely, easy subject. Um, it's okay. We'll just pass with straight A's. <laughs> big surprise no it doesn't work like that okay um cat is an extremely valuable subject and like i said it teaches us to use a computer to solve a problem it teaches us how to use a computer to study and to do research oh aren't these things you're going to do at university level right cat teaches you to do that cat teaches you to easily learn to use new software so how do you adapt to different types of software this is this is what what cat does and then have a look at this um the skills that you build in cat you will use as an accountant as a doctor right paramedics nurses photographer movie makers social media to advertise djs fashion why because these are skills that can carry you through for the rest of your life, right? People are always looking for someone to create a document for them, create a letter, a CV, a presentation, all of these different things. 
Um, and when you go into these careers, it's a, it's not just about how to do that, but the skills in terms of how to use a computer, how to understand what is hardware, what is software, troubleshooting, all these types of things. So an extremely valuable subject. ICT is important in virtually any job you can think of. You need to be able to source and process data and present information as quickly and as accurately as possible. Don't we see this in, in many high paying jobs today? You need to be able to choose and use the right ICT tools for the job at hand. And this is why taking CAT was the best decision you could have made. <laughs> no bias there. It's, it's that subject. Right. So let's look at the computer. And again, like we did last year, we're going to look at the information processing cycle. Now, how do I know this is the information processing cycle? Well, look there. Input, processing, output storage. <laughs> Seem familiar? Yes, that information processing cycle doesn't go away until um, you leave matric, right? until you finish. So again, just some quick revision. What is the computer? These are things that we did touch on last year. Remember, these are all under our computers and computing devices, right? We said they are multi-purpose, electronics, some are portable as well. And then we have the different types of computers. We have servers, desktops, laptops and notebooks, tablets and smartphones. So if we look at this list, what it's trying to show us is that from the smartphone up to the server, it's increasing in physical size and it is increasing in processing power. Okay, so your tablet should have, well, we know it's bigger than the smartphone, but it should have more processing power. Then your laptop and notebook are bigger than your tablets. Again, more processing power, your desktop, and then we know your server is a very large computer. However, have a look at this. All of these are portable. Now, why do we say that? Remember in grade 10, what we spoke about with regards to portability, it means that I can use it on the go. They work with batteries so that they are mobile. Now, let's look at our portable computers. Computers and ICT devices used for work and for entertainment at times, surfing the web, communication, social networking, etc. And if they are portable, it means I can do any of these things anywhere and at any time. Again, the portability is simply because they are working off of a battery. So, our laptops and notebooks are portable computers which use miniaturized parts that have a low power consumption because you can imagine they're working off of a battery so as to allow for portable computing on a battery. Cases with hinged screens, keyboard and suitable pointing devices. These are all built in um, to the device itself. We also have, because it's working off of a battery, we have power settings. This is a typical question that comes up in tests and exams. Most of you know that with your laptop, um, you can simply close the cover and it goes to sleep or it hibernates. But you can actually go into the settings and customize the power plan. In other words, how does it use its battery power? So here you can see, most of the time it's on a balanced plan. But you do get the high performance, which gives you performance in terms of your laptop, but it uses more energy. So the battery is not going to last as long. Your power saver is going to give you more um, you know, hours to work on it, but the performance is going to suffer a bit. So you just need to play around with those. And there you can see you can also change the settings of the brightness of the screen, how long it stays on, if it goes to sleep, um, all of those type of things. Then we have our tablets as well. Um, most of us know what our tablets are. Portable, basically computers with a touch or pen sensitive screen. It's ideal for quick, small-scale computing. Um, they have special operating systems designed for mobile devices. They should have a long battery life, and they usually connect via Wi-Fi or cellular data. Um, there's a big cost involved here, because I know with some of the iPads and tablets, if they are Wi-Fi only, you find it being a certain price, and then suddenly if it's Wi-Fi and 3G or Wi-Fi and cellular data, um, that price jumps up as well. We also get our hybrid laptops and tablets. And there you can see it's one of those where, you know, you can flip it uh, backwards. 
So you can use the screen. Sometimes the screen comes off as well. Um, so these are your hybrid tablets and laptops. Uh, they combine the touch screen with a hinge or you can remove the screen completely. So it allows the device to be used as a tablet um, or as a laptop as well. Our smartphones, we know our smartphones. Uh, we know what the smartphone can do. Large color screens, it's got its own operating system and it's got a whole range of different technologies um, that allow you to do a whole range of things in there as well. Then we also have microcontrollers. Now, a microcontroller is an integrated circuit that provides a specific operation, usually in an embedded system. So something specific that it does. This controller includes a processor, memory, and programmable input-output pins, which can connect to anything outside of it, peripherals. Now, you might not know this, but you find microcontrollers in typical household appliances like a fridge. <laughs> um, sometimes we think, no, these things, you can't have this sort of technology in a fridge. Um, how do you think the fridge does a lot of what it does? And I'm talking now the more modern ones, right? Okay, now let's continue with our types of computers. We've looked now at the portable stuff. Let's look at our servers and clients. Please remember, our server is a central computer in a network that contains collections of data and programs. They are more powerful than the normal desktop computers. Okay, They also provide services to the network. In other words, to computers that are linked in the network. Those computers are called clients. So please don't forget that the server provides the services and the client receives or makes use of those services. Um, it could be examples like file storing, um, which is the main one. It could be um, print services as well, etc. Right, then we also get dedicated devices. Again, things like um, ATMs, GPS devices. I'm talking about some of the some of the older ones that only did those things. Remember, a dedicated device is a device that's going to perform one specific task, one specific function. Okay, um, and this is something we did do in grade ten. Then we also have, and I'm just bringing all these different and new technologies, things that we use every day, our wearable computers as well. This is a wearable device that resembles and functions as a wristwatch, okay? But the wearer can answer the phone, um, read messages, listen to music, all connected from a smartphone. And we know that these watches and these devices have a number of sensors in them um, to monitor, you know, heart rate, number of steps. Oh, people are always going on. I've done 10,000 steps for the day. <laughs> they love doing that and then they go and then they go and eat a whole lot after that. Anyway, <laughs> um, calorie counters, sleep monitors, etc. Okay, moving on, we also have another one. So this wearable device is one that resembles a pair of eyeglasses, a pair of specs. These glasses can be operated by voice command. Um, many of you are familiar with this when you watch the... Um, MCU movies, um, specifically like Iron Man, and he's he's in his suit and he's able to look through the lens of his mask and he's able to see all these different things in front of him. So you have these different wearable computers. Okay, so I think we did touch on the wristwatch. Um, oh, also sport watches have GPS built into them, so they can obviously log the distance time of the workout, things like that, and here are a number of other examples as well. Um, the Fitbits were absolutely huge at a stage. Okay, so those are just some of the other technologies that are coming through. Let's go back to our motherboard. Please remember, this is the most important circuit board, the largest circuit board in your computer. These are the ports that connect to peripherals. Okay, get yourself familiar with this. You must be able to have a look at these ports and identify, oh, this is a six-channel sound card. Oh, this is, these are USB ports. This is network ports. This is a DVI, right? This is USB-C. We can see all these different things. So 
Um, you must be able to identify this because many times in the test exams that you are going to get from now in grade 11, you are going to be given pictures and be asked to identify the device. This is basically free marks if you know what's happening here, right? So let's look at our expansion slots and ports. Now, a slot, as they mentioned in here, is mounted directly onto the motherboard and allows the user to connect a board or card directly onto the motherboard. You can see here, these are my expansion slots. What does that mean? It means that it expands the capability of this motherboard. So for people doing video editing and um, gaming with their PC, they'll have a separate graphics card, which then expands the graphics capability of that motherboard. Because you can see here, there's a VGA connector, there's HDMI, which means you've got built-in graphics that the motherboard's providing, but it's not, for example, what Forza Horizon 7 or what Fortnite needs. So you are then going to have to get a separate card that will be able to render those images and, and, and you know, pictures and, and videos um, to get the highest quality possible. So an expansion slot expands the capability of that motherboard. Then we have our ports. Our ports is an external connection. So this points out of the back of the PC and allows the user to connect a device on the outside of the computer case. So please remember, this is all inside the case. This, these here, this is what sticks up or sticks out of the case at the back. And I can plug in a USB flash drive. I can plug in an external hard drive, speakers, etc. We also get what's known as SATA ports. Now, you don't necessarily have to know what SATA stands for, but I'd advise you go through it anyway. Um, and please, for all of this, you can use the link in the description dealing with my flashcards. Um, I've got flashcards covering all of these things for your theory. Um, so as to just help you even further. So SATA is a computer uh, communication bus interface that connects storage devices to the motherboard. So you might have an external hard drive um, that uses a SATA connection, and that's basically what it does. Okay, you just connect in there, and you're then able to do it. The other mention is a term that came up last year, SATA devices are hot swappable, which means that the device can be removed or installed without switching off the computer. Right, important term to know. Then lastly, protecting your information. And we just talked here about the theft of hardware. And again, this is important because this is a scenario that comes up in grade 11, comes up in grade 12, June, September, and end of year exams, where they talk about having a computer room um, how do you actually keep it safe? Because the cost um, of the hardware is obviously a lot, you know, especially if you're setting up a network and things like that. So here yeah, they mentioned the theft of hardware is not just about the cost of replacing the hardware. Think about your phone. When somebody steals your phone, are you really worried about the phone? Well, in most cases, no. What are you concerned about? What's on the phone? The details, the numbers, the messages, the photos, the videos, all of those things. So um, here they just mentioned a few data stored in the computer or device may not be backed up. So that data that's been stolen is more important than the cost of the actual hardware. The information, like I said with your phone, it might be private. Um, information increasingly stored on portable devices. In other words, people are increasingly storing things on flash drives on their phones, and they're not backing it up anyway. I mean, when last, and let's just ask this question, when last have you backed up the information on your phone? Pictures, videos, whatever it is, notes, whatever. When last have you done that? Um, you can record the serial numbers of your hardware in order to protect it so that if, it's get, if it gets sold anywhere else, um, you know, I think one of the things that they usually do is they when, when, when things are stolen, the police usually ask you for those serial numbers and stuff. And then they would go to like the scrapyards or the pawn shops and give them these details. So if somebody comes and, you know, wants to sell that, um, they can then identify that hardware as stolen. You can use cable locks to chain equipment to a solid object. You can use lockable cabinets with ventilation and you can even use motion sensors with an alarm. OK, so there are many different ways. You don't only have to mention these if you have a valid way in which 
hardware can be protected, and I say valid, then you will get the mark. All right, let's see what else. I think the last slide that we've got is for the uninterruptible power supply. Now, this is something that makes a lot of sense at the moment. Um, it's something a lot of us are talking about because of the problems with the power supply from ESCOM. This is a UPS. Now, please, there's a difference between this and some of the other things out there. This, you need to know, stands for uninterrupted power supply. That's the first thing. Secondly, what does it do? You can see over here that it's getting fed power from ESCOM. Okay, so this is like a just a big battery, um, essentially that gets charged from ESCOM. So you plug this into the wall. It gets its power, and then from the UPS, we then plug in our computer. And here you can see here's the battery that I'm talking about. So the power coming from ESCOM goes into the UPS and charges the battery inside. Now, a UPS is not designed to keep your system running forever. Not like these portable power stations and um, some of these other bigger or larger equipment. No, the UPS is designed to keep your system running for, let's say, 15, 20, maybe a half an hour. And the goal is so that you don't lose information. You can save everything, shut it down, um, and then leave it off until it's time to switch on again once ESCOMs decided to actually do their job. Okay, so please, that is what a UPS does. It is different from some of the other things out there. It has its own battery, charges from ESCOM, and it gives you just enough time to save and switch off. And folks, that is module 1.1 of your grade 11 curriculum.